Welcome to my world Won't you come on in Welcome, Charles. Yeah, thank you very much, Dick. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And I'm very happy that you have time to come here and talk with me about your time with Elvis and Colonel Tom Parker. Charles, what did you do before you ended up in the Elvis show? I was with a company called Concerts West. We produce 500 shows a year, Led Zeppelin, Chicago, Grand Funk Railroad, all of the rock acts of the era. And uh, then we became involved in the Elvis show. So I mean, before I went with Elvis, actually the night that I got a call to work with Elvis, I was out with Frank Sinatra. And to me, boring. Because I'm a rocker at heart, just like you are, see? So, but, but I, you know, uh, we did most of the Led Zeppelin shows in America and all the rock acts. So, uh, but when I got to call to go to work with Elvis, I thought, man, this is cool. Because I was an Elvis fan growing up, as I, most everybody in America was, or the world, I guess. And uh, it was really cool. I mean, it, uh, and how it turned out was better than I could ever think it was going to be. What were you doing together with Frank Sinatra? Were you booking his uh, tickets for the show and make preparing? We were the promoters, just as you're a promoter. Uh, uh, when I initially, the, the, my first contact was go to a, a venue in Alabama and put tickets on sale because in these days there was no ticket, ticket master, no computer tickets. It was all hand done one at a time. And this particular venue that the colonel wanted to play because he remembered a catfish restaurant from the old days in this town. That's the only reason they were playing the city. But there was no box office staff. You had to go hire bank tellers and people like that and do it yourself. Just do it yourself. So, and I, with my company, I was the one that had the most experience in that market with, with the Rock Axe. So I went down, hired my bank tellers, put the show on sale, sold out in you know, four or five hours. You can't sell out in 30 minutes like you do today because it's <laughs> one at a time. And I had a phone number to call when, it, when I sold out. So I dialed this number and asked for Tom Hewlett. Now, who's calling? I said, Charles Stone. He said, are you in uh, Alabama? I said, yes. He said, well, this is a colonel. I locked up. I was never expecting to talk to Colonel Parker because even then, I mean, as a promoter and in the business, he's a legend as much as Elvis is. And he said, are you in the box office? I said, yes. He said, would you check and see if there's any tickets left in the drawers? I says, well, Colonel, my manifest and my money balance, Mr. Stone, I mean, got real firm. <laughs> scared me. <laughs> so I said, yes, sir. So I set the phone on the counter and opened and shut the same drawer six times. No, sir, there are no tickets left. And he said, well, you did a good job. Come to California tomorrow. I said, well, Mr. Colonel, I'm supposed to go back to the, the Sinatra tour. Just a moment. So he puts Jerry Weintraub on the phone. And Jerry says, Charlie, come to California. I'll send somebody else to do that. So I caught the next plane to Los Angeles. So I fly out. And I get there in the evening, the next morning, and we go to Colonel's office. Well, I'm, sp I'm sitting in the lobby, or the, the entry away with uh, Jim O'Brien, his secretary. I sat there all day, and nobody talks to me. Now, I can hear over the wall, they're doing all the Elvis business, not just sitting there. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? So that evening, we go to dinner, and in my book, you read about the dinner, about the... I didn't order anything, don't give me the check. So the next day, the colonel calls me in, and Tom does, and they put me right in the middle of the, of the uh, business. I started booking the venues and tours, ordering tickets, and I had to scale the houses, just like you do. I mean, it, uh, so I became the Elvis tour producer, promoter for the re all the rest of the 70s. And what year was it when you started up with Elvis? 71, I believe. 71, okay. And it was only... RCA, no, pardon me, RCA did one tour after the 68 comeback special. And it wasn't real success. It was successful for a sellout of tickets, but they used the venue sound systems for Elvis. These are hockey. Like, you know, your hockey arenas. You can't sing through those, but that's what they use for Elvis. So when we got involved, we decided to bring in, um, I think it was Claire Brothers or Shoko, one of the big companies of the time. And no, 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 we're not going to do all pay for all that. So well, if you don't like it, we'll pay for it. So we put our system in. We did not know that up until then, Elvis had never had a monitor 
to hear himself sing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. No artist today would do it. No. So when, uh, I mean, Mr. Diskin argued it all the way. He said, you're not going to use it. Well, thank goodness George Klein came in and he knew us from the rock shows and told Elvis, you should, you should do that. So we did. And the first time Elvis started singing and you could see his smile, you couldn't wipe off his face. He never had a monitor. And if you look at all the old stuff, there are no monitors out there. It's amazing how he could pull that off. Yeah. Nobody could do that today. You know? No. They would never go on stage. You know? No. But boy, that hooked him. He loved it. You know, so that was the first time he used a monitor. Was it a full-time job for the girl to handle all this, you know, every day because those, when he did all the movies, I cannot imagine there was so much to do for him. Yes, it was. I mean, the colonel was right on there watching after him at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what would be a typical day in the office at the colonel, you know? Like well, you have a 7 o'clock breakfast. No matter what time you go to bed, you have 7 o'clock breakfast. And everybody was con uh, was together uh, in, in the colonel in the, in the colonel's little camp. You've got Loann Park, Loann, who is now is, is ex widow, George Park Hill, and myself. Occasionally, there would be Sam Thompson, Sonny, or somebody would have to come in, but mostly it was just the four or five of us, and uh, we would have breakfast, talk about everything in general, you know. Then we'd go up to the office and. Okay, March, April, May, whatever you want to do, let's go to us. We want to do this and that. So I would get on the phone and start booking venues. And uh, we'd have it routed, and we'd be sure the sound company could do it. And uh, then I would start ordering tickets. Uh, because, but in those days, if we hadn't played the venue before, I had a calculator and I had a seating chart. <laughs> I did it myself of how many seats at which price and where they are. So this was a whole do-it-yourselfer in those days and no cell phones. So that's what I would do with him most of the time. How did, uh, when you were booking venues, was it like uh, the venues paid to get Elvis there? No, 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 like no, no. You, you hired the venues? We hired the venues like you do. Entrance. But, but we hire them on a flat basis, no percentages, because, you know, they all of them get X number guarantee against a percentage. That's how they make their money. But with Elvis, uh, we'll give you 20000 flat, you supply stagehands, security, everything, and it's over with. Nobody else could do that. Yeah. But when Elvis came to a venue, the mayor, the governor, um, all the dignitaries and the politicians want seats, so the venue manager is a hero. So that's why we could get the deals we got. Plus, when Elvis came to town, the hotels filled up, the restaurants did business. It was an economic boon for the city. So it wasn't just a concert, it was an event. So people came from long distance? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. For example, if we played Atlanta, you got all within 100 or 150 miles, we didn't play those cities because they didn't have a venue. I mean, it, it, we could play three or, four, three or four shows in one city. How was it with the, you know, today you, as a local promoter, you have the sale of beer and water and popcorn and things like that. Was that still there or was it the, the Colonel and Elvis who took in the money for that? It really wasn't the Colonel, it was Elvis. I mean, Elvis would get what he wanted. If he asked for anything, he had to get it. But what he asked for, which I still have a, have a problem with, is six Coca-Colas, six cups, and one bucket of ice. He didn't drink Cokes. Okay. He drank Mountain Valley water. Okay. Who so drank the I have no idea. Maybe Joe and the guys. I don't know. Or maybe this was left over from Discount in the old days. You know, maybe he drank Coke in the 50s. I don't know. But anyway, I did what I was told, and nine times out of ten, they were untouched at the end of the night. So Elvis didn't have the demands we hear about today with the stars of today, Madonna, and things like that. They want a the pink toilet seat and things like that. that was, didn't I mean, have that, any demands like that? That was my rider, I just told you. That was it. That was That's it. All? The entire catering rider. If James Burton or Ronnie Tut wanted a Coke, concession stand. Okay. That's amazing. Yes, it is. It wouldn't work today. No, 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 not at all. But that that the impersonators gets more than Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did a show with I forgot the comedian in in the uh, uh, UK. He was filming us for part of his new video, and when he asked about complimentary tickets, I said there wasn't any. Well, what do you mean there wasn't any? I said Elvis bought tickets to his own show. 
And he starts telling me, he says, well, I didn't tell my family that. <laughs> but he says, I get more in my router than Elvis got. I said, yeah. If you get more than six Cokes, you get more than Elvis got. But everybody's amazed that Elvis, you know, of course he was only in the building, what, 10 minutes max before, before he went on. And he left straight out. What did you do before you ended up in the Elvis show? I was with a company called Concerts West. We produced 500 shows a year, Led Zeppelin, Chicago, Grand Funk Railroad, all of the rock acts of the era. And uh, then we became involved in the Elvis show. So I mean, before I went with Elvis, actually the night that I got a call to work with Elvis, I was out with Frank Sinatra. And to me, boring, because I'm a rocker at heart, just like you are, see? So, but, but I, you know, uh, we did most of the Led Zeppelin shows in America and all the rock acts, so. Uh, but when I got to call to go to work with Elvis, I thought, man, this is cool. Because I was an Elvis fan growing up, as I, most everybody in America was, or the world, I guess. And uh, it was really cool. I mean, it, uh, and how it turned out was better than I could ever think it was going to be. Well, what were you doing together with uh, Frank Sinatra? Were you booking his uh, tickets for the show and make preparing? We were the promoters, just as you're a promoter. Uh, when I initially, the, the, my first contact was go to a, a venue in Alabama and put tickets on sale because in these days there was no ticket ticket master, no computer tickets. It was all hand done one at a time. And this particular venue that the colonel wanted to play because he remembered a catfish restaurant from the old days in this town. That's the only reason they were playing the city. But there was no box office staff. You had to go hire bank tellers and people like that and do it yourself. Just do it yourself. So, and I, with my company, I was the one that had the most experience in that market with, with the Rock Axe. So I went down, hired my bank tellers, put the show on sale, sold out in you know four or five hours. You can't sell out in 30 minutes like you do today because it's <laughs> one at a time. And I had a phone number to call when, it, when I sold out. So I dialed this number and asked for Tom Hewlett. Now, who's calling? I said, Charles Stone. He said, are you in uh, Alabama? I said, yes. He said, well, this is a colonel. I locked up. I was never expecting to talk to Colonel Parker because even then, I mean, as a promoter and in the business, he's a legend as much as Elvis is. And he said, are you in the box office? I said, yes. He said, would you check and see if there's any tickets left in the drawers? I says, well, Colonel, my manifest and my money balance. Mr. Stone, I mean, got real firm. <laughs> Scared me. <laughs> so I said, yes, sir. So I set the phone on the counter and opened and shut the same drawer six times. No, sir, there are no tickets left. And he said, well, you did a good job. Come to California tomorrow. I said, well, Mr. Colonel, I'm supposed to go back to the, the Sinatra tour. Just a moment. So he puts Jerry Weintraub on the phone. And Jerry says, Charlie, come to California. I'll send somebody else to do that. So I caught the next plane to Los Angeles. So I fly out. And I get there in the evening, the next morning, and we go to Colonel's office. Well, I'm, sp I'm sitting in the lobby, or the, the entry away with uh, Jim O'Brien, his secretary. I sat there all day, and nobody talks to me. Now, I can hear over the wall, they're doing all the Elvis business, and I'm just sitting there. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? So that evening, we go to dinner, and in my book, you read about the dinner, about the... I didn't order anything, don't give me the check. So the next day, the colonel calls me in, and Tom does, and they put me right in the middle of the, of the uh, business. I started booking the venues and tours, ordering tickets, and I had to scale the houses, just like you do. I mean, it, uh, so I became the Elvis tour producer, promoter for the rest of the 70s. And what year was it when you signed up the 71, I believe. RCA, no, pardon me, RCA did one tour after the 68 comeback special. And it wasn't real success, it was successful for a sellout of tickets, but they used the venue sound systems for Elvis. These are hockey, like, you know, your hockey arenas. You can't sing through those, but that's what they use for Elvis. So when we got involved, we decided to bring in um, I think it was Claire Brothers or Shoko, one of the big companies of the time. And no, 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 we're not going to do all pay for all that. So, well, if you don't like it, we'll pay for it. So we put our system in. We did not know that up until then, Elvis had never had a monitor to hear himself sing. 
That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. No answers today would do it. No. So when, uh, I mean, Mr. Diskin argued it all the way. He said, you're not going to use it. Well, thank goodness George Klein came in and he knew us from the rock shows and told Elvis, you should, you should do that. So we did. And the first time Elvis started singing and you could see his smile, you couldn't wipe off his face. He'd never had a monitor. And if you look at all the old stuff, there are no monitors out there. It's amazing how he could pull that off. Yeah. Nobody could do that today. You know? No. They would never go on stage. You know? No. But boy, that hooked him. He loved it. You know, so that was the first time he used a monitor. Okay, that's amazing. And it was only Elvis you worked with, nobody else, just Elvis. At that time, yeah. if, if there was a lot of time between the tours, I'd go back and do some rock shows. Okay. Unless the colonel wanted me to go with him to Palm Springs or somewhere and start working on another tour, which happened more often than not. I was gone from home 200 days a year. Only with Elvis. With Elvis and the colonel, yeah. Uh, come, yeah. But how was it to, to work with the Colonel? Now you have been in Mara and you told me, but how was he to work with? Probably the, it's, if you wanted to get a education in our business, this is the best education I could have asked for. The Colonel was a very, very smart man in, in the entertainment business. And all the misconceptions of he did this, he did that, you know, I don't pay attention to it because I was there and working with him. Uh, he loved Elvis. He loved Elvis Presley. He could have had anybody in the world. He could have had the Beatles, you know. They asked him to manage them when Mr. Epstein died. And he said, no, I only manage one artist at a time. Now, who in their right mind can turn the Beatles down in their heyday yeah. when they were on top? Yeah. But he did. So uh, my education that I got from him is priceless. And uh, it's, it's paid off in a lot of ways for me. Was it a full-time job for the girl to hang little bit, you know, every day because those... When he did all the movies, I cannot imagine there was so much to do for him. Yes, it was. I mean, the colonel was right on there watching after him at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what would be a typical day in the office at the colonel, you know? Like well, you have a 7 o'clock breakfast. No matter what time you go to bed, you have 7 o'clock breakfast. And everybody was con uh, was together. Uh, in, in the colonel, in, yeah, in the colonel's little camp, you've got Loanne Park, Loanne, who is now is his ex widow, George Park Hill, and myself. Uh, occasionally, there would be Sam Thompson, Sonny, or somebody would have to come in, but mostly it was just the four or five of us, and uh, we would have breakfast, talk about everything in general, you know. Then we'd go up to the office and. Okay, March, April, May, whatever you want to do, let's go to us. We want to do this and that. So I would get on the phone and start booking venues. And uh, we'd have it routed, and we'd be sure the sound company could do it. And uh, then I would start ordering tickets. Uh, because, but in those days, if we hadn't played the venue before, I had a calculator and I had a seating chart. <laughs> I did it myself of how many seats at which price and where they are. So this was a whole do-it-yourselfer in those days, and no cell phones. How did, uh, when you were booking venues, was it like, uh, the venues paid to get Elvis there? No, 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 no. You, you hired the venues? We hired the venues the like you do. Entrance. But, but, we hire them on a flat basis, no percentages, because, you know, they all of them get X number guarantee against a percentage. That's how they make their money. But with Elvis, uh, we'll give you 20,000 flat, you supply stagehands, security, everything, and it's over with. Nobody else could do that. Yeah. But when Elvis came to a venue, the mayor, the governor, um, all the dignitaries and the politicians want seats, so the venue manager is a hero. So that's why we could get the deals we got. Plus, when Elvis came to town, the hotels filled up, the restaurants did business. It was an economic boon for the city. So it wasn't just a concert, it was an event. So people came from long distance? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. For example, if we played Atlanta, you got all within 100 or 150 miles, we didn't play those cities because they didn't have a venue. I mean, it, it, we played three or, four, three or four shows in one city. How was it with the, you know, today you, as a local promoter, you have the sale of beer and water and popcorn and things like that. Was that still there or was it the, the Colonel and Elvis who took in the money for that? It really wasn't the Colonel, it was Elvis. I mean, Elvis would get what he wanted. If he asked for anything, he had to get it. But what he asked for, which I still have a, have a problem with, is six Coca-Colas, 
six cups and one bucket of ice. He didn't drink Cokes. Okay. He drank Mountain Valley water. Okay. Who so drank the I have no idea. Maybe Joe and the guys. I don't know. Or maybe this was left over from Discount in the old days. You know, maybe he drank Coke in the 50s. I don't know. But anyway, I did what I was told, and nine times out of ten, they were untouched at the end of the night. So those didn't have the domains we hear about today with the stars of today, Madonna, and things like that. They want the pink toilet seat and things like that. that was, didn't I mean, have that, any domains like that? That was my writer, I just told you. That was it. That was it. the entire catering writer. If James Burton or Ronnie Tut wanted a Coke, concession stand. Okay. That's amazing. Yes, it is. It wouldn't work today. No, 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 not at all. But that that the impersonators gets more than it <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did a show with I forgot the comedian in in the uh, UK. He was filming us for part of his new video, and when he asked about complimentary tickets, I said there wasn't any. Well, what do you mean there wasn't any? I said Elvis bought tickets to his own show. What? And he started talking. He says. Well, I need to tell my family that. <laughs> but he says, I get more in my router than Elvis got. I said, yeah. If you get more than six Cokes, you get more than Elvis got. But everybody's amazed that Elvis, you know, of course he was only in the building, what, 10 minutes max before, before he went on. And he went straight out of the way. But tell me, how was it? Because you were the one uh, uh, standing there and waiting for Elvis to arrive, right? Correct. Tell me a little bit about how, uh, how it was when Elvis arrived to a venue. Well, it was almost like the president arrived, his security, because even the venue manager was not allowed backstage when Elvis was coming in. I mean, this room could have been backstage, nobody, because the band's all getting ready to go on the stage. They're not hanging out back there. They don't hang around where Elvis came in. And it's just it's nobody, it's just me. Not even, I don't even take a security officer with me because there's nobody back there. So when the car comes in, the overhead door goes down and Dick and Sonny and all those guys, you know, Sam, they all get out of the car. And uh, it's okay, guys, we're walking. I'm walking with them. I go down, turn right here, turn left here. Here's the hall, here's your room, whatever. And uh, that was done every night. Now, when I first started working with them, Stig, I think I've told you this before, I was told don't speak to Elvis. What? Okay, no problem. So as we're walking from the limo to the dressing room, I'm having to look around to Elvis. He's walking beside me. I'm having to look around him and say, Joe would turn left down here or turn right down here or that's it right there. I felt stupid. And I'm sure Elvis thought, who is this guy? <laughs> But after, I don't know, 10 days or so of doing that, I became accustomed to it. All of a sudden, I, okay, whatever, I guess this is the way it's going to be the rest of the time, right? Then he stops me one day. Who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm Charles Stone. I said, I'm with Conscious West, and we're the promoters of the show. And he said, well, I know that. I know who they are. He said, I'm Elvis Presley. As if I don't know who he is. You know, I'm not El I'm Elvis Presley. He said, I'm very glad to meet you. After that, we spoke and became acquaintances, you know? But he had to make the first move. How long did he have to walk from the car until this person? Different venues had different, you know, uh, some of them could be as much as the other side of this room. Some could be, uh, you know, 200 meters. Okay. Depending on the venue where, yeah. where the room was. So there are no rules for how long we should walk before you No, walk. no, no, because it, what are you going to do? You can't rebuild the building. Yeah. And Elvis was cool. He didn't care. He didn't, I mean, he was, I can say, he was happy to be there. And again, he didn't see much of the place, actually, when he no, arrived. No, he, just the backstage. Was he, was he dressed in his uh, costume yeah, when yeah, he arrived? Yeah, he yes, no, he, he was dressed already because he only had a short time. Uh, because I've seen in uh, some of the concert, in concert, the last movies, maybe mm -hmm. him, that he arrived in some kind of training suit, you know, and then he's maybe changing in the dressing He did that one because we were filming the TV show. Okay. And that was all for that purpose. Okay. Yeah. Because normally he would be dressed up right, in his jumpsuit. Right, right, right. Because the rest of them, you saw him come in in the jumpsuit. Okay. How many people did he have around him when he arrived to the Was it the same every time? Yeah, eight, nine, ten people, something like that. Were they all in the same limo or was they in the Oh, no, 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 no. They had a bus. A bus? The limo and a bus. Okay. So Elvis was traveling in the limo with Joey Esposito? Yeah, limo or sometimes he travels in a police car. A police car? Yeah. 
Yeah, if 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 we're the police car, yeah. handcuffed. No, not handcuffed. But I mean, if there wasn't a limo available, and some towns didn't have limousine service, okay, the police chief would send his car with his cops, and they would carry him around. Okay, because we would hire them for security anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, so you paid the police for taking care of the security. That's how it is. Because in Denmark, where we are now, you cannot hire in the police for things like that. It's the state paying the police officers. You know. Hmm. So in that case, it's the. Well, these were off duty. Okay, so they are. But still, I mean, they still get the you know, With Elvis, there are no rules. <laughs> I mean, there are no rules. So therefore, whatever we needed, we got. Yeah. Uh, I would always start with the police chief to hire Elvis's security detail for the hotel. And if he didn't want to do it, he'd delegate someone down, and then they would delegate the officers and take care of it. But we'd always hire a policeman or highway patrol or whomever the law enforcement because if there's a problem that's the people you want there. Yeah. And they know who to call if Absolutely, they absolutely. Yeah. But the guys who was around the television, his own bodyguards, they were taking care of his personal security or Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the police took care of the audience or who, who Well I had a different set of police in the, in the audience. I had two sets of police, one at the hotel, Elvis's hotel. And transfer, and then I would have a different set at the venue to work around the stage. So you also handled the security at the hotel when he arrived to a place? I had in advance. Okay. I, already, I set it up in advance because I was at the venue when he was at the hotel, you know. We always stayed at the hotel, but our, our floors didn't have security. Now when I'm traveling with the colonel, uh, with Elvis and not the show, then I'm on the colonel's floor and they have security. We have a guard where you can nobody can get down to our rooms. But uh, it uh, it was like presidential. I mean, uh, dignitary security. I mean, Elvis. It was uh, it was a big deal. Very secure. I heard something about that he had the whole floor for himself. You know, mm -hmm. was, it, mm -hmm. was it always like that? Yep. Yep. You couldn't share a floor because how are you going to keep? I mean, the police would be busy all night keeping people away. Yeah. And the hotels had no problem blocking off the rest of the rooms and not charging us because okay. Elvis is in the hotel. Yeah. Their restaurant is full, their bar is full, they're making a lot of money. Did he ever go down no. to a restaurant? He always got everything brought to his room. He, could, he couldn't go down. I mean, he couldn't. He was a prisoner of his own fame. Yeah. But uh, it, it, in the venue, the security around the stage was not for Elvis. He's got his guys right there. It was to keep the audience away, the girls, because if all the people robbed the stage and stood up on the scarf, the people in the front rows couldn't see. So the Colonel and Elvis always wanted everybody to be able to see the show. They were thinking of the fans. That's why they had all the security around the stage, so that everybody could always see the show. I would station a police officer in each of the aisles going down to the stage, facing away from the stage in a chair. Then I put them in front of the stage, four or five in front. And I'd tell them, I said, if you hear something going on behind you, don't turn around and look. Now don't forget, I'm a kid. I'm 25, 26 years old. Long hair, you know, you've seen my pictures. We look like drug dealers. Oh, this cop, yeah, right. Okay. If you turn around, you're going to have a problem. They're thinking, I can handle these women. Man, it never failed. One of them's going to turn around and look when he throws out that scarf because he hears a commotion. Bam! There's 20 women run by him and just flatten him in the floor. It always happened because they don't listen, you know. But I said, I know what I'm talking about. Did you ever have time to have a real conversation with Elvis or was it mostly just going from one place to another? The only time that I really had any, what you say, one-on-one -on -one conversation was when he flew into Fort Worth and uh, to see the Lisa Marie being finished out. Uh, my wife and I met him and Sonny and Linda Thompson, just the five of us, at the airport. And we were there for a couple of hours and just, you know, he was in the plane just loving. I mean, it was 100 degrees that day in, in, in Texas. <laughs> And we were dying, but he had his long sleeve, and like he always dresses, but they had stripped out the entire hull of the airplane and wires hanging everywhere. And the guy was telling, the architect was telling him where the bedroom was, where the couch, you know, showing him the thing. He was like a kid in a candy store and just loving it, man. I love this. What do y'all think? What do you think? He said, well, <laughs> you're looking at wires and aluminum. What are you supposed to think? Oh, that's going to be great, Elvis. <laughs> But uh, Elvis, I mean, he truly, truly was a nice person. 
Everybody say that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've worked with a lot of big stars, but Elvis was the nicest one of all. It's the same here if you hear some interviews with other people who was around him, but also other stars, saying that he was a very nice, uh, genuine person. You know? If he was introduced to you, he would call you sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. No ma'am and yes, sir. But don't you use that a lot in the States, actually? When I've been in the States, I have noticed that, especially in the Memphis area, you know, everybody says sir or ma'am mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. things like that. It's, uh, it's he, that was, he, grew up, you know. he grew up with that, and he, it never and that never left him. I mean, he, uh, he always did that. And stars, movie stars, wanted to meet Elvis. Um, one time in uh, Anaheim. We didn't play Los Angeles, we played Anaheim, which is about 50, 60 miles down. My, I leave word for all my security, nobody's backstage, blah, blah. And one of these guards come up to me and says, you need to come tell this uh, person that they can't park their limousine backstage. So I don't have to, you tell them, it's your job. He said, I'm not going to do it. I said, why not? He said, well, they're parked right outside the door. He said, they asked if they could park backstage. I said, no. Is it Elvis? I said, no. Is it the colonel? Then it's no. He says, well, you're going to have to go tell him because I'm not going to tell him. I said, well, why not? He said, it's Elizabeth Taylor. I said, well, I'm not going to do it either. <laughs> but I had to. So I walked out the door. And she rolled down the back, her window in the back on her side. And it really was her. I'm thinking, oh, God. You know, she's, I can't tell her no, but I had, I said, Miss Taylor, I said, as much as I would love to let you park back here, if I did, I would lose my job. She says, well, I wouldn't want you to do that. I said, but thank you very much, and we'll go park in the front. I mean, and she, Elizabeth Taylor, I mean, she's another icon, you know. Yeah, but uh, she handled it so cool that it took all the pressure off of me. Cause but she was in anyways. He could send the chauffeur up front, you know, and he could pick her up afterwards, you know, or what? Oh, yeah, yeah. But I, mean, I don't expect that she had to go back and go in. But she, she had to go through the front door to her seat. Yeah. Oh, I didn't let her in. Okay. Oh, yeah. So she had to have to let her Yes, up? yes. Oh, my God. Uh. <laughs> I mean, when I say nobody's backstage, nobody was backstage. Uh. Did you ever have the chance to meet Elvis Presley or Elizabeth Taylor, or was it like he left after the show and brought oh, yeah. the car? Well, don't feel we all left. I, I actually flew every night with him to the next city. Okay. Uh, when they said Elvis has left the building, he's on his way to the airport, and we're all in the bus. The rest of the guys always are in a, in a bus right behind them. So it's only the musicians back because there's the blame. The musicians had another. They stayed the night. And they had another airplane. Okay. Yeah, they didn't fly on the least. So Elvis actually never stayed in the hotel in the city where he was performing. Unless we did multiple shows. Yeah. Okay. Or else he will be in his plane on the way to the next uh, town. He's actually a couple of blocks away from the venue before the venue lights ever go on. Okay. Because when Alda Barnes says Elvis has left the building, he gone. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I mean, if you didn't, you'd never get him out. No. So you have to leave also because there'll be a lot of traffic, people driving away from Yep, you. yep, yep. Was he always running to the car after a show, or was he... Yeah, they walked fast. It wasn't run. They walked fast. Yeah, okay. I mean, it was a very brisk pace to the car. Because if you look at some of the movies, uh, it's actually showing that it's running. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It was that but, thing, but, but, because well, they know that they have to get out quick. Yeah. One time... Uh, <laughs> Cleveland, I believe it was, we had a little short three-foot stage, which is stupid, I mean, dangerous to do an Elvis show. And at the end of the show, you know, I get up on the, we all get on the stage, put on one knee, you've seen the pictures, you know, and Elvis puts his hand on our back when he shakes hands at the end. And his hand on our back is to keep someone from pulling him off the stage. Well, I'm on the end this time, and once again, the stage is three foot. And I see it over here, this lady got jumped up on the stage. She's maybe 60, 65 years old. A grandmother, I called her. I mean running as fast as she can run. Well, I'm the first line of defense. And don't forget, in those days I wore glasses. Okay. I get up to go meet her. She doesn't see me. And whap, just lays me out. And I'm embarrassed, number one. Then all of a sudden, I feel something wet on my face. Well, it knocked the lens out of my glasses and sliced my eyelid. I'm bleeding blood. I got blood all over the side of my face. And there's 10,000 people. I think, like, I'm supposed to be security, right? Yeah. Oh, God, you yeah, know. No lady hit you down. <laughs> no lady just laid me out, man. And uh, so 
after the show, Dr. Nick looked at it real quick and said, you need some stitches, you know. I says, well, y'all come on, I'll catch a show plane the next day. And uh, Esposito saw it real quick, and he said, no, we'll wait on you. And I was, so he said, we'll wait on him. And they waited at the airport for me to get my eyes sewed up and to go to the next town. And so Tom Hewlett, who I worked for, had the gift. He was a very slick talker. There just happened to be a hospital between the airport and the venue. We roll into the hospital. We go in, and the bleeding had pretty much stopped by that time. And he, he said, Elvis is waiting on us. We got to get this. I mean, I don't even know what he said, but when you use Elvis's name, it all of a sudden opens doors that can't be opened. I swear to God, I was. We walked in the door. Twenty minutes later, we were on the way to the airport. That's fast. Twenty minutes. That's fast in the hospital. In an emergency room, it's not you two or three hours you're in there, yeah. and I didn't even have to sign a piece of paper. He paid them in cash, and they, the doctor said, you want me to, you know, he said, I can deaden your eyelid, but there's no nerves in it. You won't feel anything anyway. I says, well, if you think I'm not going to feel anything, but if I do, you can deaden it. No, sweet. He put that over two stitches, I think two or three stitches. I mean, I was gone. And there isn't. You can stitch your eyelid, and you can't feel it. There's no nerves in there. And uh, sure enough, Elvis was waiting for us. And he said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. But then, of course, everybody laughing at me. But uh, he way held the plane for me. That's nice of him. Yeah. He could have said, "Well, I'm going." You know, he had to fly. You can you can fly tomorrow with the show. That's you know, what most I would have done, I think. You know. But see, I had to be at the venue by ten o'clock every day for the setup, just to be sure everything, go over all the security, what the ushers do, and I also had to settle the show in the evening before the show. Mm-hmm. Of course, on a sellout, you can settle the show early because mm-hmm. you know what your stage hands are, I mean, you know your bills, you settle them, then by the show starts, you you got your money, you're ready to go. Tell me, you talked about Dr. Nick, he was looking at you to begin with. Was he everybody's doctor on this show? Yeah, mm-hmm. sure, absolutely. It, it, he was our go-to guy. Yeah, it, it's what everybody forgets sometimes when they talk about how many drugs or things like that was bringing this actually that he had to take care of everybody on the show. It was not only for Elvis. The, the not drugs, I mean, but if someone had a cold, you know, if someone had a cold or someone, yeah. you know, an infection or something, he, he was the guy, but... Uh, yeah, he took care of everything, everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he took the stitches out of my eye three or four days later. Yeah. How was it to work with Colonel Parker, you know? How was he as a man? You know, we talked about oh my goodness. that he was very nice and things like that, you know? As much as everybody thinks Elvis would be the experience, the Colonel was the experience. There was never a dull day in Colonel's life. Never an adult? Never a dull day. Okay, dull day, okay, yeah. I mean, he... Uh, man, there was a su- surprise every minute with him. You never know what's going to come out of his mouth. But um, he was fun. I mean, he was fun. Once you got to know him and once he trusted you, because he didn't trust a lot of people because everybody used him to get the Elvis. Everybody used all of us trying to get the Elvis. You know that. But the colonel, man, once you became in his inner circle, it was the most interesting and fun time ever, ever. Ever. Didn't make a lot of jokes, so how was? Oh yeah, jokes and uh, but learning, just watching him maneuver through life, uh, how he handled people. He could take the most complicated scenario and make it so simple, and you think, why didn't I think of that? Can you come up with some kind of example? I give you a good example. One day, Tom Hewlett decided that we wanted to put a light show with Elvis, like we used him with Led Zeppelin, you know, with all the moving lights and stuff. (laughs) So I said, well, okay, we're in Vegas. He said, let's go upstairs and let's pitch that to the colonel. I says, well, Tom, I'm still a kid. I said, you know, you're you're, you're my boss. Now, you better pitch it. Will you come with me? I said, I'll come with you, but I don't think it's good for me to be pitching that. Because I'm the one that's out there doing all this stuff. I mean, I knew what was going to happen. So, okay, we go up, and we're sitting there, and then Tom finally brings it up. <coughs> he said, <coughs> excuse me, he said, Colonel, you know, we're doing all these Led Zeppelin shows, and we got these lights that just move, they shine, they you spotlight different people, you can do moods, you can do changing colors. He went through the whole scenario, and the Colonel's got his cigar in it. He says, what do you think about putting these with Elvis? Thinking, and I could see the little frown on his look. He said, uh, okay. He said, how many stars are there in Led Zeppelin? 
real slow and it's real, I mean purposely slow taking his puffs and the colonel said well there's six people on stage okay Mr. Stone not Charlie I said oh god now I, I have nothing to do with this right Mr. Stone uh, how many lights do you use for Elvis I said well colonel you, what the venue has it's either six or eight if they have four I bring four more in we always have a minimum of six or eight super troopers <laughs> real slow I mean I'm, I'm thinking man it's coming it's coming. He sat there and said, Mr. Hewlett, we have one star, right? He looked at Tom said, well, yeah, we got a band too. You know, he's thinking of everybody else. Mr. Stone, with all of your lights, when Elvis comes on the stage, can everybody see him? Well, yes, sir. Mr. Hewlett, if everybody can see our one star, why do we need more lights? <laughs> How do you argue with that? Yes, How do you argue with that? Uh, oh my goodness. I mean, I'm thinking, oh my God, only, only the colonel could to dissect it and come up with that. Uh, and it was not arguing more about lights or anything like End of conversation. Yeah. I mean, even Tom, how do you argue with that? Yeah. If everybody can see what you're using, why do you need to change it? And I guess also another thing Colonel Pyle was thinking about was also if you have to change it and put more into it, it would also cost extra. You know? well, it would have cost a lot of more extra, as you yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but I'm sure the band would have loved to have had lights on themselves. But the band was totally secondary. The people didn't pay to see the band. <laughs> How, uh, did, uh, did Parker ever go and talk with the band and things like that? Or was the other people taking care of that? You know, He only talked with Elvis. I think more well, if he was if, Colonel Parker and Elvis in the band. Well, if he was around, oh, sure, he'd talk to everybody, yeah. I think he really messed with Myrna quite a bit, you know, teasing her. Uh, and, and JD, he really, he and JD got along real well. He was that was funny, but oh, if he was around, but see, don't forget the Colonel was always one day ahead. He didn't attend many shows. He was always the day before. He was at the next venue taking care of the hotel and doing what he did. So he wasn't around the show that much. Mr. Diskin actually was a, took care of the band, you know. Okay. Was it like Elvis? Was he the man who was in charge of the band? He was the one. Who oh, he's in charge of everything. Okay, yeah, of course. <laughs> was he the one who was also uh, firing people if he needed a new bass player or whatever it's needed? To yeah, but as you know, he didn't do that. No. And the, the only reason that. Uh, but there wasn't change. You no, know, I, I know Jerry Schiff was not playing all this. I don't know if right. it was Jerry Schiff. Yeah, Duke Bardwell that. came in, I think, yeah. at one time. Yeah. But, yeah, but don't forget, some of these guys had other commitments, too. Yeah. Um, this is the reason they went through, uh, what, three keyboard players, I think. You know, David Briggs, Tony Brown, and Glenn D. Yeah. But Elvis didn't have much to do with that. Or, or he had, oh, the band was all his. Okay. His and uh, Mr. Diskin was his buffer. Okay. But, uh, oh, yeah, the band, I mean, that was, that was Elvis's deal. But I'm just thinking down to the detail, you know, who was the one who was uh, talking uh, salary with them and things like that? Well, uh, Elvis talked the salary, but then after it was over with, then it was all we paid the salary, you know. Okay. So he was the boss of He was the boss, yeah, absolutely. How, how was your idea about, how was the connection between Colonel and Elvis, you know? Have you any sense of how they work together? You know, were they holding meetings or were they talking on the phone? What no, I think that most of it was telephone. Every once, I mean, the colonel would meet Elvis every night at the airplane when he landed after the show. Right up there, right meet him every night. Have a little, every conversation he had was private. Nobody else was ever allowed around. So nobody knows what they talked about. Okay. Uh, but no, the colonel was right there every night to meet Elvis and have a conversation. But any other time they need to talk, they'd pick up the phone and talk. Because okay. you know, Elvis, don't forget, the colonel lived in California, Elvis lived in Bay, uh, Memphis. And uh, one day in Tahoe, uh, just to give you an idea of how the colonel really looked after Elvis, we're sitting there right, about to go to lunch in his office in Lake Tahoe. He gets a phone call from NBC. They had a cancellation for the next week in prime time. 
Well, they needed something to fill in that would be good, so they wanted an Elvis movie. Somehow the colonel retained the rights to the, some of those movies, and he made a deal. And okay, it's seven hundred fifty thousand. You can have the run next week and one rerun. Now this is a movie that's made ten years ago. Yeah. Well, so before Elvis even woke up that day, he made that seven hundred fifty grand because of the Colonel's way of doing business. Awesome. Yeah. We hear very much about how much Elvis earned and how much Colonel earned. Was it like they were sharing? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, and some some people say fifty percent each. That's some of the numbers who have been up. So Colonel had to take care of his office for his salary, and Ellis had to take care of his men for his salary. Was that how they split it up? Yeah, there was a big difference of that too. Colonel's down here. Elvis, <laughs> Elvis had a lot of guys, you know. But nonetheless, I mean, hey, you know what? It's his life. He can do what he wants to with it. It's his money. Uh, but did the Colonel make fifty percent? No, twenty-five percent. But it's been a lot about he earned fifty percent for all. Well, you know what? Yeah. Let them go find out where they got that word. You know, there's all our rumors around. Yeah. I saw the management contract at one time. But now let's go back to the last two or three years of his life. They dissolved their management contract, management artist, and and formed a new company where they became fifty fifty partners. Okay. But that, that was only in the end. That was only the last couple of years. Why, why did they do it? I can't answer that. I can't yeah. answer that question. I mean, they must have had something they were thought about doing or something. Yeah. And uh, but up until then, it was twenty five percent. I mean, what artist in their entire world wouldn't pray to give someone twenty five percent, even fifty percent of what he did for Elvis? Yeah. Whenever uh, I did a documentary with the BBC. We interviewed some songwriters that had written songs for Elvis, and the host asked them, well, you know, when you did an Elvis song, you had to give up half of your publishing for him to record it. Well, yeah. And they said, do you, how do you feel about that? And he said, well, let me explain something to you. Half of an Elvis song is better than 100% of anybody else's songs. Uh, you know, so we're happy. We have no qualms about that whatsoever. So we're still making money off of our 50 percent. When Elvis died, uh, did uh, what did Colonel Tom Parker do? Uh, did he get a new artist to handle, or what? There, was no, he? no. He advised a lot of artists, but he did not. Uh, he didn't have to financially for for one thing, but I don't think he would really want to handle anybody else. I think for two reasons. Uh, there's only one Elvis. There's never going to be another Elvis. So if he handled whomever it may be, they would expect him to do the same thing again, which it can't be done. I don't care how good a manager you are. Right, there's only going to be one Elvis. So you're going to have another star of that statue. I don't think so. <laughs> I do know that Michael Jackson asked him for a lot of advice a lot. And I do know that Celine Dion and Renee, in their beginning, really relied on him helping them. So he did help a lot of artists. And of course, as you know, Rick Nelson, he gave him he, whatever Rick wanted. He helped Rick a lot because of Greg McDonald, who was, uh, he was the, air, the colonel's, he fixed the colonel's air conditioning in Palm Springs and Elvis's. And he wanted to get in the entertainment business. So the colonel hooked him up with Rick Nelson. And Greg did an awesome job for Rick. Once again, the colonel is his mentor like he was mine. So he helped a lot of people. Mm. Uh, now we talk about he helped a lot of people because it's something that we don't hear so much about that he had this side also. Many see Colonel Park as a very strictly businessman, you know. Now we tell us that he was also had a very good sense of humor, you know, and very funny man. Did you continue seeing Colonel Tom Park after he died? Oh, absolutely. Oh, we became closer. Uh, he asked to be the godfather of my children. He asked me. I didn't ask him. Uh, every time my kids were around him, he would take them off by himself and tell little funny stories. I mean, he, if you're watching him with kids, you'd think, is this that guy that everybody's afraid of? I mean, he was a gentle giant. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I would say, to me, my father died in 83. Colonel, at that point, to me, became my second father. I mean, he was a father figure to me after Elvis died. Up until Elvis, it was strictly business. But after Elvis died, it became extremely personal. And uh, I loved the man. I mean, I, I don't have, I, I loved him. My family loved him. He did great things for my family. 
Det er Eva Gate Tilgangheim sted. I'm sorry? Det er et kørende som pakker Eva Gate ind i Tilgangheim sted. Uh, no. No, he, no. He, he didn't have any. Okay. No. And he got married to his secretary, actually, Lorraine Park. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. When did they get married? Uh, I'm going to have to say maybe around 1991. Okay. He died in what, 96? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Marie was his first wife, whom I understand Lisa Marie is named after. And, um, but he went a long time after that before he married again. And once again, let's talk about Marie and the Colonel. Uh, she, at the end, was, she didn't know anybody. I'm, I'm, I think she had some Alzheimer's. I can't prove it. I mean, I don't know, but she had a brain tumor. And the colonel hired 24-7 security, I mean, uh, nursing with her. So, I mean, but he took extremely good care of her, no matter if she knew him or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, the colonel, man, when it comes to personal and family, he was there. He was there. And the respect that he gets from everyone, except maybe some of the fans. I mean, I've seen uh, presidents, Bill Clinton, Uh, you've seen the head of uh, William Morris' office, Abe, Abe Lastfogel. I've been with them. I've been with Hal Wallace and the Colonel. He gets absolutely total respect because he's, he, you know, there's not going to be another Colonel as there was not going to be another Ellis. I mean, the man broke uh, all sorts of barriers for everybody. I mean, with Elvis, he got him up when Elvis signed with RCA. At that time, the A&R director, A&R guys, told the artist what to sing. The artist had no choice, as you may or may not know that. So when he made Elvis's contract, he said Elvis has final approval over every song he sings. First time that had ever been done. Okay. And just to main all rumors down, you know, he really took very, very good care of Elvis, you know, and I think Elvis also respected the Colonel very much, you know, and had a very good relationship, you know, with respect for each other, I think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if someone kept me on top of the world for the, my whole career, I'm not going anywhere. No. I think Nipsey Russell, the comedian, I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, he was a no. famous comedian in America. <laughs> There's a saying he said, he says, every entertainer should pray that when they go to bed at night, they wake up with a Colonel Parker under their bed. <laughs> I mean, the man was a genius. I mean, he was so smart. Everybody says he was a carny. Sure he was, but he learned. He knew how to promote. When Elvis played Las Vegas, if you didn't, if you, unless you were blind, You knew he was there. Billboards, the whole hotel was decorated. The outside of the Hilton was decorated. Had huge uh, banners everywhere. You knew Elvis was there. Mm. But could that have been done with a smaller star? It was also because Elvis was on that level, so there was the money, of course, to do all these things. Isn't that... But, that's, but, that, but that helped make part of Elvis's persona. I mean, when he rolled into Las Vegas, you couldn't look anywhere without his name. Man, you know, Elvis is here. He's arrived. I mean, it, it, it's part. It was part of the deal. Yeah. And he was Colonel Tom Parker was a genius regarding uh, promotion for an artist, right? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of people may take me issue with me on that, and that's okay. Absolutely, he knew how to promote Elvis Presley. But you could also see, if you look at some of the little pictures with Colonel Tom Parker, how he was sometimes dressed up for this occasion, you know, so everybody had a titter of what is that? Well, well, there's one picture of him taking a broom and sweeping while Elvis, and getting the stuff out of Elvis's way. I mean, like I say, he, he was funny. Yeah. He, was, he had the coats, the coats. I mean, you're right, he dresses up and, and does things. I mean, that was a Colonel. You can't, you can't help but love him. And at the end of the day, guys, Elvis could have left him any time he wanted to. But he didn't want to, you know. No. And of course they had arguments. Like in every marriage you have arguments. And of course you cannot agree on everything, you know. And there are stories that Elvis once fired Colonel, but then hired him again, you know. Sure. And and, um, and that's probably something that will happen for everybody working close together like Elvis and the Colonel did, you know. Absolutely. Well, let's take any artist in the world. Well, George Strait stayed with his manager from start to end. There's not many that started there or with the same manager they started out with. Do you know how it was? You know, was it Elvis who always told the Colonel, "Well, I like to go on to an hour." Yes, to continue on to absolutely, uh, absolutely. So it's not the Colonel saying, "Well, you have to stay nope. on to." Nope, nope. 
There's also one story about that Barbara Streisand wanted him to play in a movie, and uh, the colonel said no. A star is born. Yes, star is born. The colonel didn't say no. Do you know the story behind it? Yes, I do. Can you tell us? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> and it, it, once again, he takes a very complicated issue and makes it simple. And he told Elvis, you can play the role if you want to play it. But he, think about, just think about this. John Peters is the producer and the director. And he's Barbara Streisand's husband. So when it comes time to bill the best star in the movie and do the headline billing, think about who he's going to put first. Oh, well, I don't want to do that. That was Elvis's choice. And it was a smart choice because Barbara Streisand should not have been headlined over Elvis Presley. No. But it would have happened that way if he'd done it. When Chris Christopherson did it, you didn't see his name above Barbara's, did you? No. <laughs> so Elvis made the right, I think, I, you know, people said, well, he should well, I think he made the right choice because why should he be under Barbara Streisand? He was a bigger star than her. Yeah. But couldn't that have been written into the contract that Elvis would be the head? Oh, they wouldn't have done it. Okay. I mean, John Peters was her husband and the, he yeah. was his movie. He has to live with her. <laughs> Do you know, of course it was before your time, do you know if there was any, uh, any time uh, an argument or a talk between Elvis and the Kern about his movies? Because if you hear Elvis uh, later in life, he jokes a little bit about his movies he made. But at any time where Elvis said, well, I wanted to get out of these movies, you know, where he just had to continue because of contract? Or, or what was the reason he continued doing all these not so good movies in my eyes? I can take it on my own. but. Do you know what the story behind this? Well, Elvis wasn't touring. Elvis had to have income. And at the time, he was the highest paid movie star of the time. He got a million dollars a movie. That's a lot of movie, that's a lot of money back in those days. And he didn't have to go on tour, he just had to stay on the set. That was Elvis's choice. And Elvis approved every script. The Colonel never once made, first of all, you can't make Elvis do anything. Okay. I don't care who you are, you're not going to make Elvis do anything he didn't want to do. So he, uh, the Colonel, and uh, even with Hal Wallace that night that I had a meeting, uh, Elvis approved every script himself. And they also said that he memorized everybody's lines, not just his. He knew the whole, everybody's role in lines when he went to, he was that into the movies. But back to what you're probably going to ask me shortly, the dinner I had with Colonel and Hal Wallace. You know who Hal Wallace is? Mean, he was the, okay. I just said, you know, once again, I'm 25, 26 years old. I said, Mr. Wallace, I'd like to ask you something. I mean, I, that's one of the few times I opened my mouth that night. I said, you know, Elvis never did a, a serious role. I said, was there ever a script presented to him that he could have been in a serious actor? He said, well, Charles, he said, if we had a script of that nature, we couldn't have presented it to Elvis. I said, why? He said, no studio would ever finance a movie if Elvis didn't sing in it. He said, you got the biggest star in the world. Why would you not use his talents? Good point. Yeah. Good point. He said, you know, he, the studios wouldn't do the movie. Yeah, it's amazing. That's another way to look at it, of course. But he, of course, did Char away. He was only singing the, what is it called, the intro of the child song. Mm -hmm. child. But once again, that's a million bucks in his pocket. Yeah. I think in those days, I'm not mistaken, those movies didn't take but a couple of three weeks to shoot. Mm -hmm. Of course, today, yeah, today it takes a long time. Yeah. But uh, so, you know, he made a very good living doing that. And maybe even if he made a little bit joke with it later in his shows and things like that with some of the movies, you know, he must have been loving it while he was doing it or else he would not have continued to. Well, I can say he approved every script. Yeah. But I mean, and are there some things that maybe you and I have looked back on and said, did I really do, what was I thinking? He could have the same thing. I don't know. I don't know that. No. But, uh, and you know, I mean, I'm still close to most of his guys today. You know, we still, I mean, when you worked on the Elvis show, you created a family bond. I mean, it was not like Zeppelin or Chicago, or I mean, I knew the guys, but once we're done, we don't keep in touch. Uh, but I, you know, Dick and Sam are two of my very, very best friends. 
I talk to Esposito, you know, writing at least on email once a month. But, uh, you know, we're all good friends. We still like to keep in touch and I love to go get on programs with them where we all can pull out the stories we forgot. Yeah. But uh, we were a family. But it's also, isn't it also because it's different because Ellis was such a big star that still today people want you to come and tell stories about how it was to work with him. They don't do that with many other stars. You know, you talked about Frank Sinatra. I don't know how many how many Frank Sinatra conversation, uh, uh, conventions have you been on? None. Uh, he was a big star too, but it's not the same. You not have the opportunity to meet those guys right. who work with Frank Sinatra. Because Ellis was such a big man, a star, that... Mm -hmm. People still want you to come and tell about it. Steg, I am so honored when that happens to me because, you know, at the time I didn't see my role as any significant. I mean, promoting Elvis is like promoting Zeppelin. I mean, that's what I did all my life. So it wasn't like I was doing something that I'm going to be that I'm going to be remembered for. I mean, when you do your acts, you know, I mean, if 20 years from now they want to call you and talk about uh, Big Fat Snake or did you want you know you're with them. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean? I was just a promoter. But uh, I'm honored and I love to talk. You know, my wife is what made me do the book because she says, What you did with the Elvis show, nobody else did. I wasn't a bodyguard. And so I did all the business for the tours, you know. And everybody had a role in it, you know. And, Absolutely. You know, to, and, and a part of you to look at things. You saw things from different angles. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if that's right in this work. But and all my neighbors, all my neighbors, I would leave for 30 days, 20 days at a time and come back. And they probably thought, man, because I never told anybody what I did. I did with the rock acts, but I didn't tell them I was working with Elvis because if we ever worked the area, my phone wouldn't stop ringing for tickets. I, one day in, I don't know, September, August, or hot in the summertime, we did our last show. So I came home the next day. I had to mow the yard. And it was like 100 degrees. I'm out there mowing. I got nasty dirt and hot. I'm thinking, man, yet last night I was with Elvis Presley and, and so-and-so. Something's wrong with this picture, you know. My wife said, shut up and mow. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're all human. We're all human. Do you think Elvis would, what do you think Elvis would have said if there were still people talking about him now so long time after he died? Do you think he expected that things would go on so long time? No. No, yeah. Once again, Elvis, in my opinion only, I mean, everybody has different opinions. I don't think Elvis knew how big a star he was or how big of an influence he had on people or the world. I don't think he, I really don't think he knew that. Do you think Colonel Tom Parker would have thought it would go on so long time? Maybe. Maybe. I don't mean the Colonel. I know, I know he wasn't prepared for it to stop when it did. But uh, every star does have an end somewhere, you know. Maybe you continue working clubs, but if you can't fill 10,000 seat arenas, it's basically over. So, and you know, not many stars can go their entire life doing that. So I think somewhere somebody thought that eventually it will, the run will be over, but who knows? Yeah. And today after Elvis and after a long time, you started working with Elvis again in some way with your own Elvis in person? Oh my goodness, yeah. I mean, you could have bet me my house that I would be doing that. You're going to be done. I said, no, 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 no. But uh, the situation came up, and i got to be honest with you, Steve, I'm glad I did. Uh, I have what I consider one of the best Elvis tribute shows in the world. But more than that, it put me back into the Elvis world, and, you know, I get, I mean, people pay me to come talk. Life is good. My wife says, I'll pay you to shut up. <laughs> but, uh, no, I love sharing my stories. I really do, because uh, mine are different than all the other guys. Uh, because I did something that they didn't, you know, didn't do. I did all the work. When I wrote my book, uh, the publisher, he said, "What about you?" He came to my house, looked at all my paperwork. You know, I've got letters from hotels confirming that was his suite. How much we paid the cops. I mean, I have all my documentation. He said, "Oh man, the people love that." I said, "It's boring." I mean, it's like if you have one of your settlement sheets. What do you mean people want to see that? He said, trust me. So I let him take whatever he wanted to do to put in the book. And I think you've seen that. There. There's a rooming list and everything. And people say, we love seeing that. What? 
you know, I mean, with you and me, it's everyday work. Mm -hmm. You know, but I'm just glad I kept it. And I've got a lot of sheets where I have scribbled and made the net how much we made on each show. Uh, now I think there's one page that's uh, somewhere not in the book, but how much it costs to fly the Lisa Marie from place to place in fuel. Before we end, can you tell me a little, or the view, the people who watch this program, a little anecdote from uh, your years with Elvis and the Colonel, a little funny one in, in the program? Well, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin, I actually advanced the city two months ahead of time. I know what I did because I have my notes. We're there, we set up, sound set up about three o'clock. I asked the venue manager what time I'm doing my security meeting. He said, well, what security did you order? I said, when we were here. Oh, well, I thought you were doing that. I had not one police officer for that evening. I said, well, we can't do a show without security. So we got on the phone and I mean, honest to God, up until six o'clock, I got. I heard my last guy. I mean, we we could not have done a show without security, and he didn't order it. So we hired private security guards and few police officers they could round up, and I did it with a very minimal amount of security. But that could have been a big disaster, and Elvis never knew it. Colonel never knew it. Otherwise, they'd have said what. <laughs> because I went to the city ahead of time and did it. Uh, but another anecdote that you're talking about, I know you're going to, it's a funny one about Colonel. Uh, I won't name the city. We were all, it's one of the few shows that, that Colonel was at. So we're all sitting backstage just waiting, you know. Uh, the show was, we already did the first half of the show. So it's intermission, Elvis going to be there any time. The fire marshal comes back. He says, we have to evacuate the building. We've had a bomb threat. You have to evacuate the building. And uh, we knew what he was wanting. In some places, you know, he wanted some money not to do it. And so the colonel says, Charlie, come here. He said, he said go tell the fire marshal he can, uh, he'll have to make the announcement. And he gets up and starts going out the door. And the fire marshal says, well, where's colonel going? He says, he's going to tell Elvis not to come, and he's leaving. If there's going to be a bomb threat, we don't want to be here. So we're, we're leaving, and Elvis isn't going to show up. Oh, well, but, 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 but. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't real. Don't worry about it. Okay. But the colonel called his bluff. Huh? You, by the way, did you have bomb threats and things like that very often? That they... no, that's only one. Okay. And that was fake. Yeah, it was only to get some extra. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Elvis is because of the people that, that like to see his show, uh, it's quite, nobody ever had a problem, you know. Yeah. I'll take it back. Oral Roberts University. You know who I'm talking about? The televangelist on TV. Okay. He's a preacher who has a TV show. Yeah. And uh, we, he owns a uh, uh, university. We played his venue. The afternoon of the show, there was a shooting out front. Okay. Didn't kill anybody. He shot them, but there was a shooting out in front of the venue that afternoon that we were going to play there. I said, "Man, this is a Christian university, you know, and they owned by a preacher and a shooting. That's never happened before." That's fantastic. But thank you very much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, who do I send the who do I send the bill to? What? Who do I send the bill to? No, it's my pleasure, Steve. Thank you very much. And we've been friends a long time. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Og det var så slut på programmet Tro på det. Jeg håber, I har nyt det, og jeg vil gerne sige tak, fordi I kiggede med. Welcome to my world Won't you come on in